not need any introductions. Uh, Jules Pfeiffer um, is a celebrated cartoonist, a screenwriter, a playwright, a children's illustrator. And he has been working for many years in the field of cartoons in particular. Um, uh, and, and for that, that's one of the reasons why we've asked him to come here today, is to look at Domier's legacy and also talk about uh, cartooning as it sort of evolved since then, particularly cartooning and graphic humor within the 20th century, which is what he's also teaching a course here at Dartmouth on that subject. So we're uh, very privileged to be able to hear him speak about that. And without much ado, I'm going to turn it over to him to... Thank you. Uh... This is an impressive turnout. Some people will do anything to come in from the rain. Uh, so you may be here for days. Uh, I think it's, uh, I was really gratified uh, that Kathy asked me to give a talk on Daumier and, uh, and, and, and who came, who followed. Because as a cartoonist and a cartoonist who played with politics for many years, um, you quickly discover uh, if, as you go over the field, that you can do any number of shows about after Daumier in a way that you can't do after Gil Ray, who was a great cartoonist, or after Cruchet, that they, that nobody, really followed uh, uh, Gil Ray. Uh, that was a style, a way of work, a, a way of approach, as br brilliant for its time, that virtually disappeared as a form of approach. But Daumier, working actively in the 1840s, 50s, 60s. Um, over a hundred years ago, and um, people are still learning from him. People are still trying to draw like him. And what I want to show you today is, uh, through PowerPoint, and this is my assistant, Catherine Roy, is going to help us out here, um, is, um, is the pe are, 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 are a number of the people who directly, very directly in some cases, indirectly in other cases, um, were influenced, affected, and if not in terms of the art and the line drawing, certainly the attitude, which was in your face, opposition to everything that was going on, and, 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 and done so courageously that he got into trouble with the law a few times, and uh, he was jailed, wasn't he? Uh, it's, uh, not many of us were good enough to get jailed. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, my old friend Paul Conrad, the great cartoonist for the LA Times, uh, it, we had a rift in our friendship when he was put on en Nixon's enemies list and I wasn't. It, it, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, can we swim the next one too? Daumier had extraordinary range of styles and movements and this is, you know, I mean this, what we see here is the kind of almost classic political art, common for him in his time, but also that he, that, that uh, years later, 60 years later, before World War I, and even in time of World War I, was common in terms of style, as, we, as we'll see. Um, and if you look around the walls at this work, it's, it's, all, it's all relevant, it's all, uh, it, it's all very potent, and what he, what he had that other cartoonists didn't have, and other illustrators didn't have, is a sense of feeling, of action of the moment, a sense of immediacy, a sense of uh, um, that he did this five minutes before, you know, and, and, uh, and it just appeared in print. And when you realize that these are lithographs and they had to be, be you know, laboriously worked out, that sense of immediacy is quite astonishing. Uh, next one, and, uh, and of course the paintings. The, the, the other things he did, besides politic politics, was genre paintings and genre drawings of life uh, in the Paris of his time, uh, often life's, uh, the life of the artist, selling his work, standing on the corner, looking, and, um, and what he caught, what he caught over and over and over again was not just uh, a figure, but he, he was a storyteller. There's a certain theatricality in his work and there's a certain uh, element of storytelling, of feeling. I mean, one can imagine oneself as you look at this for a while, sensing uh, 
what this man is thinking, what he's feeling, his loneliness. I mean, he may be surrounded by a mob of people 30 seconds later, but you feel here a great sense of wistfulness. Is anybody going to buy anything? Am I going to eat tonight? Uh, a sense of loneliness. You know, and, 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 or, and will anybody appreciate what I do or care about what I do in comparison with the more classic art up there on the wall? Next one, please. Uh, and here, in contrast, is a strong political cartoon. Bodies on the field. Uh, it, it's, uh, and the figure of death, of course. And again, the sense of that, that, that graphic uh, urgency of, of, of the line. Um, next one, please. Uh, the same thing. Movement, movement, movement. The hat flying off the head. This is a real... <laughs> This is a drawing that animates. I mean, you can feel that. They, uh, you can feel the movement of the balloon. The balloon is in the air. You can, you, you can see it sway. Um, it's moving back and forth. You can, the, the coat is up. The, the hat flies off. I mean, it is, uh, it's every, he uses all the tricks of cartoonists who follow to show, I mean, except for speed lines, to, <laughs> And in a way, the, the lines of the balloon make, make up street speed lines. By the lines of the balloon, we know which way the wind is blowing. Uh, we, know, uh, uh, we know the urgency that he's, we, first of all, uh, we also know the physical impossibility of the picture because that guy would be out of the balloon in 30 seconds and falling to his death. <laughs> I mean, look at him, look at him. He, 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 there's no way of maintaining your balance. <laughs> I, I like, but, but that's, Something at this very moment that just occurred to me, and well, I've looked at this picture any number of times, it never dawned on me before until uh, I had to come up with ideas in front of you, that, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that this is so. Because what he does, uh, and it's what cartoonists and, and uh, other magicians do, is create an illusion, a kind of a sleight of hand, that for the moment gives wh whatever he's drawing Credibility. So you believe it. You believe the situation. You believe the look of it. You don't ask any questions. All of us in the presence of great cartoonists and great artists uh, become children again. We become innocents. We buy the party line because he's, he, it, it's, it's delivered with such a sense of urgency, such a sense of immediacy that you go for it. it, it it's also a form of enchantment. You, you want to go with the illusion. You want to go with the magic act, the cards coming out, the... the the pigeons flying out, and this is his pigeon. Uh, next, please. Uh, and here, a <laughs> terrible headache. <laughs> terrible, terrible devil. You know, it's a. Uh, I felt that way this morning. It, 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 uh, and uh, God willing, I'll feel that way tomorrow morning. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, um, and again, the dramatic, you know, his people, he loved theater, Daumier, and his people are performers. They're actors. And he gets the performance pitch perfect. Uh, he casts it brilliantly. He, he gets the body language brilliantly. Uh, you don't have to read any captions to understand what's going on here. Can we have the next one? Uh, and here, a, a more you know, a, 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 Traditional cartoon with the large, the enlarged heads. He didn't do all, all that many of them, but he did wonderful ones. The large heads and little bodies, uh, being chased. Next one, please. And look at that. <laughs> God, you know the the. That's when he went to jail for. <laughs> Big That's when he went to jail for. That's the one he went to jail for. We'll talk about that for a moment. What what <laughs> what, 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 what does it represent? So, in uh, i.e., he went to jail for telling the truth, which is, uh, uh, which to this day is a prison offense. Uh, <laughs> next one, please. <laughs> next one, please. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's Domier in jail. <laughs> the judge looking down on the prisoner, and we know who he approves of and who he disapproves of. I mean, you, this, uh, the, the prisoner is very sympathetically handled. And this is a harsh, judgmental, the hawk nose, uh, the glaring eyes. Again, the representation, the storytelling. 
It's all about storytelling, the helplessness, the legs, the posture of the legs, the, and the posture of the body as he, as he, as he leans against the, the, the stone wall. Um, the body language tells us everything. And there are some great painters who just never really tell us anything with their body language. They tell us things with their, uh, with their craft, with their use of color, with their compositions. But over and over and over, everything you see of Domiers is about body language, it's about gesture, it's about performance. Next one, Catherine. Uh, and this is Don Quixote and Sancho Panza uh, coming across a dead uh, donkey. And look at the loneliness and the isolation of the, the, these two men uh, coming upon the scene. And look at, look at the gorgeous posture of the Don tall in the saddle, sword up in the air, shield, and it's all very sketchy. It's very little more than a doodle, and yet the gesture tells you everything you have to know, the gesture and the subtle shading. Uh, and, and, and his squire just behind him, smudged, uh, second to the, to the great dawn, and it's, it's dramatic, it's evocative, and it could be a, a still from a John Ford Western. Uh, next one, please. Uh, here, too, the action. You see the movement of the mother and child as she's carrying laundry. And boy, is she carrying that weight. And you feel the weight she's carrying. It's, uh, again, the theatrics of it. And the child, and they're rushing along, moving along. And the burden of what she's carrying. Again, it's theater. It, but it's also life in the times. It's, it's, it's showing what people don't uh, um, usually see on the Paris streets. Or when they see it, they ignore it. They don't see it. He makes us see it. Next one, please. So it could be the same mother, same child. And this is a very famous and beautiful painting. Next one, please. More. The next one. And this is uh, the last of the Dormiers. It's a demonstration. Uh, and in a sense, all of the art we've just seen are one form or another of demonstration. Uh, they, they are announcements, they are descriptions, and they are protests, and they are evocative, and, they, uh, and it's small wonder that he left its enormous legacy, which we're going to continue with now, uh, and show other artists uh, influenced and descended from him. Uh, oh, no, this is the last one, I guess. Uh, Again, beautiful. Uh, next one. And this is, now we go into the early 20th century. Uh, a great cartoonist named Art Young, uh, who became well known doing commercial, uh, commercial art, originally for the St. Louis Post Dispatch. He was an editorial cartoonist. Uh, started out, came from an old line American family, started out as a Republican, moved further and further to the left, and finally. Uh, became a socialist and uh, joined uh, the Masses magazine when it was forming and eventually became its art director. And this was a drawing called Fear. And um, I've had it done a little more in, in, in close-up. When you see, just hear talk about body language and movement and, uh, uh, and people reacting in fear. We don't know what the fear is, but we do know that generation upon generation of Americans have been uh, driven by fear uh, that, that's been uh, propagated from the top, that there have been any, any number of periods of uh, official political paranoia in our lives, uh, from uh, the Palmer raids in the 1920s to McCarthyism uh, to uh, uh, the Bush years. I mean, that, that, uh, and it's always worked effectively and has always worn itself out, and then it's worked again. And, um, and what we seem to learn about this and the, and, and the use of fear, the use of uh, uh, striking up fear in people, the fear factor, is over the years, what we have learned is close to nothing. It's a, we always open ourselves to it. The people are always driven by it, and, uh, but it's, it's a great field of endeavor for cartoonists. Here he's confused. Next one. This is John Sloan. Uh, I mean, I was just George, George Bellows, I'm, I'm sorry. And Bellows and Sloan and Henry, uh, you know, represented what came to be called to 
the great consternation and resentment, the Ashcan School of Art. They were the American Impressionists. They were the ones not giving us pretty scenes, but the urban landscapes that were very much <coughs> um, uh, in common all through the late 19th, early 20th century, and, you know, and somewhat beyond the ghettos and the mobs of people. And they got a sense, uh, not even necessarily critical, although there was a lot of criticism in some of these, but just this is the way people lived. This is the way people looked. This is the way they uh, were together. And, and, uh, and if you notice, just about all of them are white, one black man. You know, that this is how, how people lived back then at the turn of the century and, and, and after. And, uh, and, and the reason was capitalism, this monster capitalism, and, uh, and the worker, the, 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 so the hideous uh, pig who represents money and corporate, the corporations and monopoly capital, and the heroic worker who was going to slay him with votes. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then a lot of labels, cartoon labels around, and this is Art Young showing us in masses uh, what the editorial policy of that magazine was and what, uh, and what they were hoping for. What, you know, they, this, these cartoons were deliberately designed as propaganda, deliberately designed to incite, get people moving, and al also deliberately designed to uh, inflame and, uh, and encourage an opposition that was rising in terms of uh, socialist politics, in terms of populism. This is, these are the pre-World War I days. Uh, and uh, next, please. This is, jo again, George Bellows, a very fi famous fight painting. And here you feel, as with the Dumiers, the immediacy of these two men going at each other in the ring. Uh, extraordinary, brutal, uh, and theatrical it, um, I mean, you, you feel their weight, you, you, it's, uh, and at the same time, you feel the passionate concentration of the fans in there. Can we have the next one? Uh, and this is John Sloan. Uh, Sloan, more than anyone else, loved these scenes of life in New York, uh, women on the roof with a clothesline. There's a beautiful one, another Sloan one right here. And it's interesting about this. It's a beautiful print, and a beautiful drawing, rather. And, and um, but what's odd about this is what's beautiful is the evo evocation of mood. What's strange about it are the heads of the people in the, in the window. They, it, it looks like a Hollywood cast version of slum life. Here is clearly a middle-class father, you know, looking like, um, oh, a little like Rock Hudson when he was a young man, you know, <laughs> and, he, and he's smoking a pipe, and he's reading the paper, probably the New York Times, not the daily. <laughs> uh, uh, and there is his rather pretty daughter and his beautiful wife, uh, and so, but it, it's, it's, it's the poor in the idealized version of them, and it's hard to know what the, this appeared in the Hearst publication as an illustration for a short story, and according to the literature, it, it, uh, it, was, it had nothing to do with the story. <laughs> so I, who knows what the real, uh, the real reason why he did this for, but it's a gorgeous piece of composition, a lovely piece of art, but he miscast the whole thing. It's, they're all badly cast. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, as opposed to these women up on the roof who look like they belong there. Next, please. And uh, here's a gorgeous bar scene. Uh, a bar scene. The, the, the life in bars, the life in the community of the bars, where people, men, uh, and, and, uh, and a clearly few women were allowed in, uh, 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 sit and eat and contemplate, and it's where they have a little piece and very little piece. Very, there's very little else out there for them. It's all just the mob scene outside that window. Uh, and this is summer on the roof. When I was a kid in the Bronx, this is where we went to escape the heat. It was called Tar Beach. <laughs> and Tar Beach existed as long as there were tenements, as long as there were roofs, and as long as there was July and August in the city. Uh, and look at the city behind that. And, 
and the cat, and you know, they're, they're enjoying themselves. This is this is this is a vacation. This is time out. They're, they're having a good time. And there's the pussy cat, as there was the, the cat in the previous one. Next one, please. And I mean, this is a glorious subway. Now, do you have that Thomas Hart Benton locomotive we can go to? The use of transportation. You know, the early 20th century brought in these monster modes of transportation that didn't exist before um, in the cities. I mean, out west, they, I mean, there were the trains that moved us west. This is a locomotive by Thomas Hart Benton. Do you feel that rush, rushing forward in this direction? You feel this rushing forward? You, you, I mean, you see in both cases the train, like, a, like an animal, is crouching and moving forward and bent the way it, it isn't really in real life. But it's like a charging beast, uh, devouring and um, and look that black cloud of smoke, uh, and all of it is given speed by the upright poles, which holds the, the, the uprights make are stationary devices, and against it you have this onrushing train, which makes it look a lot faster than if you didn't have those poles. Uh, and so it is here, these uprights. Uh, and the crowd below, look at that massive crowd. There's ma thousands of people. Just a normal Tuesday in New York, you know, and uh, Tuesday night, people coming home from work. This is the, the, the L trains. I grew up with these things still around. And, uh, and they used to go by our house uh, extra loud in the middle of the night, just a block away from where we lived in, in the Bronx. Next one, please. And this is snow in the city. I particularly, there, there was a, horse-drawn carriages. Uh, this is Robert Henry, again, one of the founders of the Ashcan School and also one of the contributors to masses, to the masses. Uh, these men loved, I mean, you can tell if, you know, that, that this is an art not only of um, depiction and, and, and protest, there was a, they loved this scene, they, it excited them. There was a, something about the rhythm and the beat and of the life that um, enchanted them and moved them to this subject matter. Next one, please. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge by Chal Hazard. The Brooklyn Bridge was new at the time. It went up some 20, 30 years earlier. Uh, all of this was new. The subway system was new. Um, the cars were new. I mean, it was a whole new universe, and, uh, and, and these artists were commenting on stuff that just didn't exist 50 years earlier. Next one. Crossing the Brooklyn Bridge, Child Hassan. Uh, people walking, some, you know, for, uh, walking with children, it's, uh, it's probably a Sunday, and this is what you did for sport. This is what you did to get some exercise. Uh, the city was crowded, the city is jam-packed, and one way to find a way of getting some relief is to walk back and forth on Brooklyn Bridge unless you live near one of the parks up near Central Park or Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Next one, please. And this was the single most important publication of protest called Masses, uh, edited by Max Eastman and having every important uh, socially relevant writer uh, at the time, all of them working for free, Floyd Dell, Max Eastman, others, uh, and artists like John Sloan, and Art Young, and Henry, and George Bellows, and um, Boardman Robinson, and we'll see, we'll see more of their work here. Uh, this is an Art Young, a famous Art Young drawing. Um, a little boy and a little girl, and he says something, I can't get the line right, but I remember it vaguely. He says, look, Molly, uh, the stars are as thick as bedbugs. And that was the, you know, <laughs> and you see their tracks in the snow and they're looking up and, and it's a sweet, romantic look, you know, picture of, of kids and uh, with a very honest frame of reference in terms of their poverty, in terms of their day-to-day -day living. And again, as with Domaine, it just happened. You see them standing there. They could have just got there 10 seconds earlier. It has a sense of immediacy of the moment. And the line, like Domier's, is in, and, and the, the use of lithograph uh, crown, like Domier's, is 
uh, assertive and, um, and journalistic. It gives that sense of immediacy. Um, uh, the next one, please. And Art Young, this time in broad stroke pen, brush, and ink, showing us uh, in, in typical socialist cartoon, political cartoon fashion, with the labels of uh, uh, child labor, factory, uh, the huge capitalist uh, uh, being fed profits out of the uh, out of the suffering of others. It's uh, I mean this is what great cartoon art uh, is made of the 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 sense of shape and uh, I mean this this is designed to get people mad. This is designed to have people look at it and piss them off and say let's mar let's overthrow the government not you know today in two hours and and. Uh, it seldom did that, but uh, it's uh, next one, please. Again, it's the, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, two drunks, uh, and Republican and Democratic voters looking down at this approvingly. Um, and the bartender says, "Say, have we got to help those old bums up again?" The two-party system. And this is, you know, back in the ni 1912, 1913. Uh, here's an art young husband and wife. Look at the body language here. Look how exhausted he is. Look, look at those wide eyes. Look how tired he is. Look the way those hands, those large hands are just helplessly worn out, leaning against the thing. And look at his fed up wife, who's, you know, who's been at the stove for hours. She, and, uh, and she's saying, he says, I glory, I'm tired. And she says, there you go, you're tired. Here I'd be standing over a hot stove all day and you working in a nice cool sewer. <laughs> and this is of May 1913. So it's a, it's a gag cartoon about the working class. And, um, and it's, a, it, it's a funny piece of clearly Irish immigrants. You know, and his, there's his pipe. Uh, and, but theatrically, Look at each of them, how wonderfully cast they are, how wonderfully acting out they are. Uh, he's not just sitting there exhausted. He's sitting there exhausted with her standing over him with a look of impatience as she's turning, she just turned around a second earlier to look at him. And all of us, all of us know from our own lives and our own parents and our own our grandparents, uh, people who move that way, look that way. I mean, it's just honest. It's, it's just true, true, true. Uh, every every line in that is true, uh, and it makes the gag funnier because you've got people uh, people doing a comic line, looking like characters out of a Eugene O'Neill play. Next, please. Uh, and here's uh, uh, um, Art Young in black and white, and and uh, the rich a history. Uh, 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 it's it's titled On We, where he's bored. She's bored, the dog is bored. <laughs> and of course, it's a Lhasa Apso, a Tibetan aristocratic dog uh, on, a, on a huge pillow. And these are people who are so tired. He's the money maker in the family. They dress up every night in order to have no fun at all. Uh, next one, please. Uh, money power, public prosecutor, uh, judge, bring in the prisoner, public prosecutor. He won't let me. <laughs> Next one, please. And here, penitentiary, man behind bars, looking rather honest, and he doesn't belong behind bars. Capitalist system, an average clerk works more than, you know, it, it's going on about how long a clerk works, and, you know, and he's in the prison of his own. It's, a, it's a, uh, that old phrase used about slavery and then wage slavery, the, the suffering of the people who work for a living, who earn a living, and get no pleasure out of their lives and have no choice but to do what they have to do. This is what made this protest art so effective because they spoke uh, to an audience who saw very little of this in the mainstream newspapers of the time. You, we didn't find this uh, in the New York world or, uh, in, or, the, or the other uh, populist pr popular press at the time. They could be critical. But they weren't on the war path as these as masses were and as they were artists were. And, uh, and in the tradition, so completely the tradition of Daumier. Next one, please. Um, this is Art Young again, killing labor unions. 
uh, the sport of industrial kings. And these are the years of strikes and the police being called out and, uh, and uh, putting down demonstrations and putting them down harshly as they did during the Pullman strike some years earlier and every strike that was going on at the time. And Patterson strike. Next one, please. Uh, a very effective, beautiful cover of the masses. Uh, even more beautiful in color, which I'm sorry we don't have from 1916. Uh, next. Uh, J.P. Morgan. Huh. What do you... Uh, it, would, it, would, it would be... Uh, uh, the president is saying it would be well to have a compass of some kind. And uh, he says, huh. Why do you want that? I, I, I will tell you which way to turn. Now, this is odd because it says Odd Young at the, out there, but it's, a, it's another signature. This is this label that doesn't look like, look like an Odd Young, but it's a strong political comment, also from the masses. Next one, please. Here's Odd Young. Um, Daily Journal says murder. Daily World says explosion. And the, the woman buying the newspaper uh, says, I think I'll take the murder. Uh, that there was no different then than it is now. The, 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 um, uh, the cliché expressed and coverage of local news on what gets, uh, in terms of picking out stories for local TV news, it, the old line goes, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. And um, here's Art Young again, in a much more classical style, you know, full of line. The editorial we, political boss, the owner of the paper, the stockholder, the editor's wife, the editor, the big advertiser, the stenographer, all the people who decide what goes in the newspaper that, <coughs> that the average reader picks up and thinks is the objective truth. <laughs> uh, and the paper is called The Independent. <laughs> <laughs> all right, th these guys were angry. They were up in arms, and every line they show, I mean, take a look at the, the, how the, he's leaning into it. Again, the theatricality of it. Uh, the, the, uh, this is ownership. He has the look of an owner. He has the posture of an owner. He has the, uh, he has the weight. Uh, all of these people carry weight with them. You feel the bulk on the paper, on the page. And it's kind of amazing how effectively this can be uh, translated. I mean, this is just a couple of lines. And, uh, but you feel 200 pounds, another 250 pounds, and uh, that, that these are creatures who can barely move, but they make decisions that affect everybody's lives. Uh, next, please. Uh, every worker for, for himself, the boss is looking out rather pleased, you know, non-union. Uh, all workers organized, the boss is looking out the window or at the picture, really, really frightened. And that's just pure propaganda art, not a very <coughs> a subtle cartoon, and not a very good cartoon. And it's called Organize the Unorganized. He's, he's preaching here. Um, next. Here's a cover of the masses. Again, a beautiful, very much in the tradition of Daumier. Uh, February 1913. Next, please. Uh, and the, the, the newspaper, House of Prostitution. I mean, their enemy, as much as anything else, was the press of the time. And who goes in? The editorial writer dressed as a... a, 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 a they're all dressed as, uh, as hookers, as madams, as, you know, as one thing or another. And into them comes the big advertiser as the customer. And, uh, the, and anything the big advertiser wants, they're going to give him. The, ma the madam, editor and proprietor. Next, please. Again, look at the look at the hand, look at the foot, and the big, the big it's uh, it's all attitude, 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 uh, and it's to remind the reader over and over and over again that when you go out and pick up your newspaper, uh, when you uh, it's what you read is not the truth. What you read is not necessarily what happened. It's not very much different from watching cable news these days. <laughs> it hasn't changed that much. What you get, what they tell you, uh, what people actually believe is better represented by John Stewart and, 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 and Colbert than it is by what you see on Fox or 
uh, or CNN. Next, please. Uh, a beautiful art young here of suffering, the suffering individual, the poor man, and the wealthy man asleep in bed, huge belly, huge pillows, uh, comfortable while it's raining down. To say these guys were class conscious is to, <laughs> is to say absolutely nothing. Next, please. Uh, another art, your map of the Near East na and natural resources, financial interest. Now remember, if we have another, I'll depend on you to make it a very holy war, the minister. Yes, sir, I'll do my best, sir. And clearly this is about the church and the church backing up wars. This is, just, uh, I, I would bet, before uh, or just during World War I, which uh, Art Young, al along with the editorial staff of the Mass, is opposed and were put on trial for their opposition to the war. Um, they were tried twice and got off with hung juries twice. Uh, Art Young, look at that. Okay, uh, next, please. And here is, uh, uh, he's had the Associated Press uh, pour, uh, pouring poison into the news. Uh, here's the news, lies, the press fact, prejudice, slander, hatred of labor organizations, um, and, uh, and the Associated Press sued over this cartoon, saying, I guess they didn't poison. <laughs> they didn't. Now, what's interesting, uh, and this was very much so on the left, all of the left, you see uh, just about everything represented there, you've got prejudice, but you don't really, there's, there's very little said in those years about race. There's very little said about racism. There, there's more said about women and women's uh, uh, issues and suffrage. But uh, um, there was no consciousness, or not much consciousness, although there were lynchings you know, all through those years and, and increasing lynchings. There was very little consciousness among socialists or, or, other, or, or other protesters or liberals in general uh, of... Um, of the horrors of racism, of lynchings, and now it's, uh, we have further, and, and we have further on a wonderful, wonderful original Marsh drawing. That's an exception to this. Can we go on? I'll show it to you when you come up. Uh, Boardman Robinson was a great cartoonist and painter, illustrator and painter, also working for masses. And this is going to war, Europe, 1916, uh, and showing how we, uh, the donkey is being led off the precipice into war. Now, well, not all of the artists for masses were against the war. There's a beautiful and scary and quite awful um, bellows. Which, can you show us that? This is a bellows. That's pro-war. Bellow is one of the artists of the masses who split from them editorially. Uh, it shows what the Hun does to uh, you know, chopping off the breast of a helpless woman who's pinned to, the, to, to a door, a very effective piece of anti-German propaganda art uh, of which there was much during, you know, leading us into that war. A lot of you will remember the stories of the, the, the raping of Belgian nuns and, and uh, uh, all of that uh, propaganda and proselytizing that's necessary to work up the ire of the people. Before the Spanish-American War, there was, uh, there was similar stories. Before every war, there were similar stories. Here, another Boardman Robinson, German, uh, his, uh, a, a, a German soldier um, sticking a blade, uh, you know, a saber into, in, into peace but it's a powerful, powerful piece of graphic art and, uh, and very reminiscent of Domeo. Next, please. Uh, Maurice Becker, a brilliant artist for the, for, for the masses, is showing, um, in this cartoon it's called Ammunition, and what the two cannons, the two howitzers are blowing out are not cannonballs, but bodies, the bodies of people who are going to fight in the war, and also the innocent masses who are going to be killed in the war. And here they are being flung out, flung out at each other. It's a very simple, effective piece of art. Next, please. Uh, more Boardman Robinson of war. Uh, 
these guys had a subject matter that, that was almost irresistible in terms of their approach to their work, the, 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 the heavy line, uh, the brutal force of it. Next, please. Uh, it's uh, Jesus up against the wall being uh, executed by uh, the armies of different nations. Next, please. Uh, John Sloan, you've done very well now, he says. What is left, uh, now, uh, and this is after the war, you've done very well. Now what is left of you can go back to work. And there's nothing left of the body. And uh, next, please. And here we have the cover of the masses, which is, Can we go on? Next, please. Now, this is interesting. It, it's, uh, the caption here is a John Sloan calling the Christian bluff. This is an anti-clerical one. It's, uh, it's the poor who clearly took sanctuary in the church uh, looking for a place to sleep, and the cops are called, and they're rushing them out. They're driving them out of the church, calling the bluff. And it's a very effective piece of art. You know, it, it's, uh, again, the sense, uh, it could be one of those demonstration photographs. You get a sense of uh, the weariness, the resignation, uh, the, the helplessness of the crowd. There's no anger here. There's just a sense of resignation. The cops are just doing their jobs. The cops aren't being <coughs> uh, 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 violent, they're just leading them out, and there's no reason to be violent because nobody, nobody is really complaining. Everybody is playing his role. Uh, they went in to call the Christian bluff, they were kicked out knowing the bluff would be called, uh, and now they're being ushered out, having made their point. Next, please. This is uh, Robert, the, the, perhaps the most dramatic and, and in many ways the most gifted of the political cartoonists of the masses and the one who uh, experimented most with the use of the heavy lithograph crayon which affected a whole generation of cartoonists after him was Robert Minor who uh, after blazing the trail for a whole generation of cartoonists then quit cartooning uh, by, the late, by the early 1940s or late 30s and became a political hack for the Communist Party, organizing and writing tracts which were unreadable and giving up this art which was so extraordinary. Um, here is the Anthony Comstock figure at, at, uh, in the early 20th century saying, Your Honor, this woman is, uh, 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 this woman is guilty of giving birth to a naked child. <laughs> Next, please. Here's, here's Robert Minor again. Uh, and it's uh, the officer saying, at last, the perfect soldier. <laughs> this Schwarzeneggian brute with no head. Um, and again, look at that line. Look at the, and, and look at him rubbing his hands. And you can see the hands being rubbed, how graphic it is, the posture. Uh, next, please. And uh, here is a minor one of a labor protest. And what happens? A union man uh, being bayoneted. Again, it's a powerful, powerful drawing. I think this, the, this is, the original of this is in the Library of Congress. It's just gorgeous. Next, please. Uh, and here is uh, Minor. It's, uh, oh, wicked flesh, he says. And there is this, the censor, uh, a small, fat man with a big sword tearing apart this voluptuous woman. Next, please. Uh, Minor again, I don't know what this relates to, but it's the rich man and, 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 and the two rich men, or three rich men. I, one of them looks like uh, Morgan, and, it must be Morgan and Rockefeller and who else? Who, you know, but they're all, they're all malefactors of wealth and, 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 uh, and bad guys. Next, please. Uh, and here uh, there was vote on suffrage, which lost, and the men are celebrating, saying, uh, they ain't our equals yet. <laughs> Next, please. And here's a woman in protest throwing a brick. Look how graphic that is. Maurice Becker. Next, please. Uh, George Bellows again. 
Next, please. Stuart Davis. Now, this is not the Stuart Davis that anybody would recognize as Stuart Davis, but it's a brilliant um, editorial drawing. And it, 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 it looks as a jazz piano, the women in the bar. It's, a, it's just a barroom life. Next, please. Oscar Cesare in the masses, another street scene. Next, please. Uh, then on the way back to uh, past the first war, there was a cartoonist for the New York Daily News named C.D. Batchelor. And this is a famous drawing of his. And war is standing in the doorway looking at a Euro any European youth, it says here. And she says, as the, the mistress says, come on in, I'll treat you right. I used to know your daddy. <laughs> the endlessness of one war leading to another war leading to another war. And, uh, and, 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 and that it's seductive. Um, Next, please. Uh, the Depression years. Daniel Fitzpatrick was a cartoonist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, evidently influenced by Robert Minor. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, the, the, the caption is one person out of every 10. This is during the, the, the Great Depression. Next, please. And this is an Adolf Dane, the watercolorist. And he's looking at an issue of the masses and he's quite shocked, quite horrified by what he's reading. It's a beautiful line drawing. And here is Reginald Marsh. Um, and a mother is holding up her child. And she says, this is her first lynching. And, and, and lynchings were sport at the time in the 1920s. And we have some other marshes to show you. Can we see those? It's a march did some wonderful street scenes, people just moving around. Uh, again, the, the, the theatricality, the mood, the sense of just shuffling. And you, know, that, that, uh, and you have another one too, don't you? Oh, it doesn't matter. It's a <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was at him. Uh, let's go on. Uh, and this is Roland Kirby, this very famous drawing of, of, of a figure who represented prohibition, thou shalt not. And he was used for all of the censorship, all, not just prohibition, but for you know, sexually, uh, every other aspect of do notism uh, that was repressive in the American character in those years. And, uh, and he was imitated by others, but it's a gorgeous drawing. Next, please. Now, moving on to modern times and uh, my contemporary, uh, Paul Conrad in the Los Angeles Times. Look at that, you know, that, that Afro haircut, that's a powder cake and about to blow up. Black teenagers, 40% unemployed, a news item it says here. But look how powerful that, that, uh, that drawing is, which is scratchboard. It's made to look like a woodcut. And it it, it, the drawing looks like it's about to explode. So this tradition uh, moves on and on and on. This is the 1960s. Um, next, please. Uh, Conrad doing Nixon. <laughs> uh, crucifying himself. Looking very, very angry, but very determined. And you feel the hammer moving. You can see the power of that hammer. Next, please. Uh, Conrad in another mood. Names not listed on the Vietnam War Memorial. The, the, uh, the civilian dead. The Vietnamese who we mostly forgot during the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Next, please. Uh, and Conrad doing a take on the raising of the flag of Iwo Jima. It's interesting how this flag waving at Iwo Jima has been used over the years by cartoonists. And I'm going to show you a few instances. Uh, no, uh, Steve Benson for the Arizona Republic. This is the Iraq War Memorial. There they are raising a, a, an oil well with the American flag on it. Um, next, please. This is Conrad again, flag waving at Guantanamo, Groucho, Chico, and Harpo. Uh, next, please. Uh, and then there, just to show you also the tradition of great caricatures that, you know, that uh, came to us through those years. Al Frew was... In, uh, um, doing Benjamin Disraeli here in the 1920s. Uh, um, 
in Vanity Fair magazine. Next, please. Uh, 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 let's see who the actress is. Mary Nash. Mary Nash. Uh, I haven't seen much of Mary recently. Uh, next, please. Uh, well, uh, clearly, this is out the great Al Hirschfield doing the, the great Arthur Miller, and it's an extraordinary portrait of Miller. It looks exactly like <laughs> Miller and everyone's impression of Miller and every asp. This is what extraordinary caricature does. It gets, it gets the truth in every every line of it, every aspect of it, and it and, and it looks so simple and so easy. It just appears. Um, at uh, I once described Al, who was a friend, as as. as uh, as the Fred Astaire of caricatures. They made it look so easy, and yet you knew, take a look at it, and you know it's so hard. Next, please. Uh, this is Waiting for Lefty, and uh, Odette's first play that I think Al did sometime later, but that's Ilya Kazan, the director, who, who, who was one of the stars of the play, who was an actor then. Uh, Kazan was later famous for turning in all of his friends, and. Uh, uh, during, and and uh, helping to uh, keep the blacklist going. Next, please. This is uh, Bert Lahr, uh, E.G. Marshall, Kurt Kasner, and that's Alvin Epstein on the back. It's lucky in uh, the first production in New York of Waiting for Godot. Uh, next, please. This is, of course, is Carol Channing in Hello, Dolly. And it's... Uh, Look how little there is to the droid, to the face. It's just, uh, but it's immediately recognizable who, who it is and what it is. And there she is up. Uh, you know, that, that I once said that the last glamour that existed on Broadway was in, or in the drawings of Al Hirschfeld, long after Broadway's sense of glamour and, and, and uh, 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 singularity had disappeared. There were these gorgeous Hirschfelds that appeared every Sunday on the front page of the New York Times. Next, please. Uh, look at that, Judith Jameson, the great dancer. Uh, look at that, look at the hands. When you feel the, the, the fingers splayed, moving out, the expression, and you feel a stretch, and it's just whoop. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, and there they are. You know, Al loved to do the Marx Brothers and, uh, and did them over and over and over again. And as good as his Groucho was, his Harpers were always his best. Uh, because he was a mime like Al. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, and this is the great Zero Mostel. And uh, f um, it must be, no, I, I don't know what this is. It's, it's not Fiddler on the Roof. But what's that? Anyhow. Uh, but it's, it's simply wonderful. He did Zero over and over and over again. Next, please. And this is... Uh, another great caricature. This is Edward Sorrell, uh, and uh, and this, of course, is Nixon as royalty. It, it, and, and where Al used few lines, Ed uses lots of lines, but he, and scribbles, but he evokes an equally strong mood, an equally strong politics. It's a gorgeous Nixon, <laughs> and 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 uh, if Nixon can be described as gorgeous, and only and only in cartoons can he be described that way. Next, please. Uh, and, and, uh, and here is Nixon as he is coming out of a sewer <laughs> and in a very famous Herblock thing. Here he comes now. Uh, next, please. This is the great David Levine for the New York Review of Books uh, with uh, Ronald, Reagan, Ronald Reagan with a you know, beaming. And look at those lines around the eyes. Uh, you can see the orange complexion <laughs> in, in, in that drawing, although it's not in color. Uh, and the sense of well-being, the sense of self-satisfaction. Levine is, uh, was Hirschfeld's only rival in the last half of the 20th century, working in a very different mode uh, and uh, much more political uh, and, uh, and, as you will see in a moment, very tough politics. Next, please. And very much in a tradition of the masses. That's, uh, as you will recognize, Henry Kissinger, a naked, tattooed Henry Kissinger uh, with, uh, with his various policies and conquests uh, tattooed all over his body. And, uh, and it's obscene, it's vulgar, and it's gorgeous and beautiful and, and immediate 
immediately compelling. And there's an even worse Kissinger to come. You may want to shield your eyes. <laughs> uh, next, please. There we are. This was rejected by the New York Review of Books. Nixon's, uh, uh, Kissinger. <laughs> and, um, and was published in The Nation. Um, and feminist staff members of The Nation protested because they said it was a, a sexist cartoon. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, Levine and, uh, and, and his take on Nixon. Next, please. And this is a, one of the immortal cartoons, of all, uh, political cartoons of all time. Um, when uh, LBJ uh, had a kidney removed, uh, and it, surgery on his kidney, he, sh he famously showed the press in his famously vulgar style, his operation, his scar. And Levine immediately took that scar and turned it into a map of Vietnam. <laughs> Next, please. And this is, uh, and this is me, and uh, with taking a, a comic strip approach. A um, an, an older man saying, I used to think I was poor. Then they told me I wasn't poor. I was needed, needy. Then they told me it was self-defeating to think of myself as needy. I was deprived. Then they told me deprived was a bad image. I was underprivileged. Then they told me underprivileged was overused. I was disadvantaged. I still don't have a dime, but I have a great vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is, you know, in terms of line and theatricality, the use of a comic strip to get an editorial point across and to show character, to show how he's thinking, the weight of the hands on the chair, the movement. Uh, each, each drawing is slightly different. But it's the, the camera is fixed in the same shape because in order to get the story across, um, which is the main thing, uh, I just want to move the reader through. Next one, please. My dancer. Um, he says, a dance in 1967. In this dance, I have symbolized the nation in flux, establishing flesh approaches to the problems of poverty, crime in the streets, Vietnam and civil rights. A dance in 1967, and she crouches with a gun in her hand. Uh, <laughs> next, please. Uh, and here's the dancer again. Next, please. And these are, I've done some watercolor dances in, in the last 15 years, and a few of them. One more, please. Uh, next one. I, I have a Fred Astaire obsession. Uh, <laughs> there we are. Uh, next, please. Next. And next. I can't. I won't. I must. I'll die if I try. I'll die if I don't try. I will. I did. What have I done? <laughs> Thank you very much.